reinforcement learning class? What kinds of stuff have you already learned to do? Play a target. <laughs> this is a quiz, okay. What have the assignments been? Well, we have someone with imitation learning coming up with a robotic car, for example. Uh, uh, you know, we gotta get the students to internalize this stuff. It's not like watching TV. Um, so an interesting question is whether physical robot learning has anything to do with learning Atari games. Uh, learning Atari games is a huge accomplishment, uh, but uh, I'm not at all sure it has anything to do with learning to be a baseball player or something like that. You guys have any opinions on that? Agree. Anyone disagree? So in what sense do you think it's very different? Well, let me, I'll, t I'll talk, this, that is what this talk is about. And this talk is from my somewhat narrow point of view. I am going to be talking about controlling big, fast robots. Uh, so there's a time scale issue. And there's a complexity issue. Uh, in, when I mean big, I, ha I mean lots of joints, say 30 joints. So the state of the system, uh, if you just pay attention to the position and velocities of all the joints, might be 60. And if you pay attention to a lot of other things, you might easily have a state vector that's 100 elements. And milliseconds matter. That's very different from a lot of other things. So you know, I'm going to make very strong statements. But you have to uh, view that through the perspective of I'm talking about only a particular part of robot control. So let me go ahead and, 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 and start going through this. Uh, since this is a deep reinforcement learning class, I was interested in talking about deep reinforcement learning, which is not necessarily something I do. Uh, but as I was thinking about it, I thought maybe all this stuff on deep reinforcement learning the whole field is barking up the wrong tree. And I asked, that's, by the way, an, um, at least an American idiom, maybe English as well, when you have a dog searching for something, and a fox, for example, and the fox has run up a tree, but if the dog has gone to the wrong tree and is barking, and the fox is over here, the fox can sneak off. That's what that means. Um, you know, I was thinking, are the things that deep reinforcement learning are likely to provide anything like the kinds of things we have to do to make the robots we work with actually do tasks? And, uh, you know, maybe there's a distinction between figuring out what the right, you know, approximating, approximating the right function. And to me, what deep reinforcement learning is about is being able to represent complexity. Maybe that's not really the issue in robot learning. So, uh, you know, we're going to run that up the flag and, and see what happens. So, I'm interested in skill. As a kid, I was very clumsy chubby. All my brothers were better than I was, so I spent the rest of my life automating uh, things that if you show them to someone on the street, they say, yes, this obviously involves skill. This is something called devil sticking. The robot uh, is, is watching the colored balls. That's me. This was 20 years ago. Um, this uh, figure is uh, very close to the Disney animatronic figures, and don't tell anyone, but recently we shipped President Trump. Okay, this is the kind of performance I would like to see. Here are two robots racing. It's really interesting to do the same thing, and they're cranking down. Oh, one robot fell over. Look, you know, he can locomote in all sorts of ways. Look at the other robot. It got up. It's continuing. Okay. This is where we are. This is Akshar Rai, current graduate student. 
This is Si Wan Feng, uh, who graduated recently, is now working for the Toyota Research Institute. And this is what's known as robot abuse. <laughs> I'll explain what the controller is, but now you should just enjoy Si Wan, you know, figuring out how to kick the robot. Yeah, it takes a lot of skill to kick the robot. And he's learning, he's doing a lot of learning. The robot, not so much. It's, we've pretty much programmed uh, on how to balance. Here it's trying to walk forward and being kicked. When the robot revolution comes, Siwan is the first to go. <laughs> you know, it's, it's harsh. So what's difficult about this task is these rocks are loose. They're not glued down to the floor. So they roll under the robot's feet. So you actually, it's not that you're stepping on rough terrain that's fixed. The terrain is rolling underneath you. So you have to adjust to it very, very fast. Okay. I have a particular ideology. I believe learning is optimization. The very definition of learning, which is getting better at something, is the very definition of optimization, getting better at something. They have to be the same thing. I also believe all of AI is optimization. Now, when I was a graduate student, I was told, in theory, artificial intelligence is optimization. But the optimization problems are so hard that we can't possibly solve them. So we have to find some other way to do artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, we haven't found some other way to do artificial intelligence. And fortunately, computers get exponentially faster and cheaper. So if we just have the same old ideas and wait long enough, I've been waiting about 30 years, so I've seen a huge trillion-fold speed up in computers. The same ideas we had in the 1950s and 1960s now work very well. And we can actually solve some really tough optimization problems. So what I'm going to be talking about is, OK, what optimization problem do we want to solve? And I was told that last week you guys did something called trajectory optimization. So I thought I'd show you a video of me doing learning. This is, again, something 20 years ago. I was young and svelte. Uh, those are colored balls. The robot's imitating what I did. This is called swing up. It's like uh, the cart pole problem. It's also like the mountain car problem. That's a double swing up, so it's a different style. You have to swing once and then get the energy to propagate into the next swing. Now, you know, that was the, the demo version. Now I'm gonna show you all the learning. So first the robot gives it a try. And you can ask the question, well, why doesn't the robot get it right the first time? And the answer is, it doesn't see how I activated my muscles, so it doesn't know that. And it is mechanically different. So that took about four or five trials. The double pump is harder to do. So here, you know, that's the first try. This is the second try. Basically, he is initialized by your trajectories. Correct. So this is a combination of what we call learning from demonstration. And then after that, it's learning from practice, otherwise known as reinforcement learning. All the other trials, basically what's going on is we're improving the model of how the robot works and then redoing the trajectory optimization. Now, a lot of people assign emotions to the robot and say right about now it's, it's angry or right before that it was angry. But eventually, the robot gets a good enough model and we are using robust trajectory optimization procedures. So even with a you know, model that's nowhere close to perfect, it can do the right thing. Can I ask you something? Yeah, sure. Uh, do you also track this yellow ball to estimate how far away from the desired goals? And like, you need to do all state. Are we doing visual servoing? No, no, not servoing, but just to do your trajectory, your self trials, how to get your reward. You measure how far away is the yellow ball from the target? Or? OK. So the reward is generate a perception that is similar to the perception you got when the human did it. And since we have solved a huge problem that we always sweep under the rug, which is what is it you're supposed to imitate in learning from imitation? 
because the robot can only see the colored balls, so it tries to get the colored balls to do the same thing, which basically means the same trajectory. Now, it is a huge problem in learning from demonstration because uh, you know, I could show you juggling and you could decide that the, th the important thing to imitate was my breathing and leave the, uh, the juggling out of it. So, uh, you know, that's, that's perhaps AI complete and I, I have to put that aside. Now, one of the stylistic points I want to make is if you're in the real robot business, you'd really like to do tens of trials or less than 10 trials, not hundreds or thousands of trials. It is perfectly okay to have a model or to learn a model and it's great if a robot can learn by thinking about the task or simulating the task or reasoning about the task. That's fantastic. Let's go to town on, on, on all of that. But when the robot actually moves, we want very few movements. Now, be unfortunately, behaviors you learn in simulation don't usually work on real robots. And so a little more learning is needed. Amazingly enough, and I've been involved in projects such as the DARPA Little Dog Project where we all had identical robots, and the DARPA Robotics Challenge where we all had identical Atlas robots, I can tell you behaviors learned on one robot that work really well, perfectly, don't work on an identical robot either. And that's very troubling. It says that model-based approaches aren't enough to do the job. Yeah? For these uh, Absolutely not. Okay. Totally closed loop behaviors. So I want to ask you something. Yeah, sure. So the robots have the same degree of freedom, the same number of degrees of freedom. The identical robots are identical. I see. And then your actions, your policy, was it the desired velocities and positions of your body joints, or were your torques, the torques on the robot joint? So for big robots, we're always dealing with torques. Uh, for little dog, which were sort of, they look like actual chihuahua cockroaches, uh, it is small enough that even though we did command torques and desired positions velocity to servos, you could argue that it was heavily geared enough that what we were really commanding are, are essentially positions. Mm -hmm. You know, now you get in, into an argument about the mechanics of something at that scale. Uh -huh. But we are commanding torques. One well, way that I, this is the result of training in one robot and testing one identically getting to work is that if your policy is in terms of body joints and body joint, uh, joints and joint velocities, since we have the same, and then you adapt online the, the thing that takes you from the desired, the inverse kinematics that takes you from the desired joints and velocities to the desired torques, and you adapt this online using model learning, then maybe you can generalize. Yes. Uh, I will get to the point where I say we're going to do hierarchical control, in other words, layers, and uh, we, can, we can talk about what generalizes well and what is tough to generalize and needs adjustment. And your instinct is right. Things at the lowest level, closest to the actuators, need the most adjustment. That's true. Okay, amazingly enough, one of the things that came out of the DARPA Robotics Challenge was everybody's doing roughly the same thing to control humanoid robots on that scale, or at least the Atlas robots. It turns out because we can't solve the full optimization problem fast enough, it's useful to break it into modules and solve the modules at different rates. So at the highest level, we figure out where to put our feet. Where's a good place to put your feet? And we use a search process called A star. I hope you all are familiar with that. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain it, but it's, it's a particular way of doing discrete optimization. Once we figure out where the feet are gonna go, we essentially, it's like we plan a flight path for the center of mass. So as I step, my center of mass goes roughly in a sinusoid. We plan that using trajectory optimization. The techniques you learned last week are perfectly good. 
When we're actually running the robot, we rerun that optimization. Basically, as fast as we can. At the lowest possible level, we have to figure out what torques to apply at the joints. And we know what contact forces we need because that comes out of what drives the center of mass. And so what we do is we do something called inverse dynamics based on a model that trades off desired accelerations of the joints, torques, and contact forces to get something, some kinematic pattern that's close to what you asked for, but minimizes some additional optimization criteria. And that's a way to be more robust. Was this lowest bullet point a um, like flat? So you did not the full body optimization uh, across the whole robot simultaneously, or was it more modular? So you're pointing out, so let me first highlight the time scales. A star search, we may replan the, the footsteps once every 10 seconds. We may rerun a full trajectory optimization once a second. Every 10 milliseconds, we may replan for the next second where the center of mass is going. And every millisecond, we are solving a, a quadratic program uh, for the full body control that tells us accelerations, contact forces, and torques. So this level is, has a full body model, and you're absolutely right. This model is very complex, and models further up the chain that look further forward in time are much simpler. Do you know if anyone did something where they, instead of doing a full body control at the low level, they did some kind of more local, low level control that then was synchronized at a slightly higher level? Of the Atlas robots, pretty much everybody did this. Now, a guy uh, who's been working very hard on speeding all these computations up, Imo Todorov at the University of Washington, he's actually been able to do, you know, to use full body models further up in the chain. And, you know, if we wait 10 years, computers will be so fast that we'll be able to use full body models for everything. But at this point in time, this is how we divide the optimization problem up. Simple models allow you to look far in the future. Complicated models allow you to look one millisecond ahead. Uh, that's the way we can get it to run on current computers. Can I ask you, this pyramid, are there any learnable parameters anywhere? Do you learn maybe the model or where to step? Maybe you can learn or not? Okay, at the A star level, you have a perception system that's giving you where the terrain is. And you need to turn that into what we call a cost map that says, this is a good place to step with 0.75, and this is a terrible place to step 0.1. So that transformation from whatever your sensors say to the cost map is definitely you should learn it. Once you have the cost map, you know, you can because you're solving the same optimization problem over and over again, you can learn to optimize more effectively. Uh, and that's tweaking the parameters of the A star algorithm so it works well based on what you've been, you're looking at roughly the same terrain as you go, they're the same type of terrain, so the statistics of your optimization 10 seconds ago should guide the parameters you use in your, for your current optimization. So that's also learnable. One of the ideological fights is at this trajectory optimization level and receding horizon control, why can't we do that perfectly? And let me tell you what the problem is. Nobody with these big humanoid robots can locate their center of mass better than within two centimeters. Okay, everybody admitted that. We admitted it, Boston Dynamics admitted it, MIT, Florida, they all admit it. And you have to ask the question, why is that? And we had a DARPA program manager look at us and say, what is wrong with you people? The laws of physics have been known for hundreds of years. You should be able to locate your center of mass you know, to microns. But what he forgets 
is that everything is made out of jello. Structures bend when you apply forces to them. Joints, uh, they can have backlash, that's in the direction they move, but they can also have play, which is they can move in ways that are orthogonal to the rotation axis. Okay, transmissions bend. It's all jello. And it is unrealistic, even if you have a perfect model of the lengths of the undeformed robot and a perfect model of the weights of the undeformed robot, that when you're running the robot and we're generating big forces, those models will be accurate. And I, I want you to think about something. When you're running and your muscles contract, what do you think happens to all the fluids in your leg? Okay, you're mostly water. When your muscles contract, a lot of fluids get pushed around. And your location of your center of mass and moment of inertia change quite drastically. There's another exciting thing you should do next time you tear your ACL ligament, is ask for a movie x-ray of your joint. It is amazing how the little parts of your knee move around while you're running or walking. And the simple descriptions of the human body basically aren't very accurate. So I would argue at some level it's fundamentally impossible unless you're going to do finite element models, which means you have to have incredible resolution of your sensors all over the body to even get the data to exactly predict what's going on uh, in terms of positions, velocities, accelerations, and torques. Exactly. So why don't we do learning at this to fix the residual? Okay. Therapy? If you can't predict it, you can't learn it either. I can't tell you how many graduate students I have sacrificed. <laughs> You know, everyone who comes in, I say, your first job in your first year is to make a more accurate model of the robot. And sooner or later, the pile of graduate students, you say, wow, this is just not working out. And uh, you have to acknowledge if you, you know, if you have at some level the wrong model structure or inadequate sensing to make the model in the first place, not only can you not model it as an engineer, but you can't learn it either. You can learn other things that compensate for not knowing a model, but you know the quest for the perfect model is doomed. Because we don't have perfect state estimation, you're saying. And the degree of freedom of the model is huge, right? If I start talking about the deformation of my body parts, and clearly humans are made out of soft stuff, we deform all over the place, you know, what is the dimensionality of that model going to be? Yeah? How bad is it? Like, you said that you were able to estimate the position of the model. It's two million dollars bad. Okay? Because what you do when you realize that your robot doesn't work like the, you think it should is you spend more and more money for more and more accurate sensors and better engineering to make the problem go away. The Sarcos robot we have is a $1 million robot. The Atlas robot is a $2 million robot. It's this steady escalation where we try to engineer out this problem, and that also is doomed unless your robot is going to weigh 1,000 pounds, and you build it like a milling machine. There's a reason milling machines are things in the shop that are big hunks of metal and are very stiff. There's a reason milling machines are built and engineered the way they are. They're very accurate because they just have a lot of structure. And if we want a robot that we're going to hug, you don't want a lot of structure. Was there a question in the back? Okay. But why don't we instrument our training environment with super expensive sensors, learn the mapping of the model, because of this problem it's not I mean first of all even that quest is probably doomed but making a supermodel once isn't all that useful believe it or not 
when you have hydraulic robots like I do, you're pushing oil through tiny holes. That oil heats up a lot. The robot, by the time you run it for an hour, is really hot. It's hot to touch. That heat has a huge effect on how the hydraulics work, and it changes the size of the robot. Are you going to model that? Another graduate student down the drain. <laughs> okay. Okay, to sort of summarize this, we're making the optimization problem easier by using a temporal hierarchy. Uh, you, to generalize from locomotion, in general, on the time scale of seconds, we select behaviors. We think we have a bunch of primitive behaviors you select from. You're doing some sort of limited horizon look ahead and re-optimization. At the level, at a very fast time scale, you're figuring out what to do with your muscles or actuators. And uh, I'm gonna leave this out, but there are things you can do to make your control uh, more robust. Uh, unfortunately, it requires sort of, sort of a lot of uh, technical tools that I don't think we have. Okay. By the way, a good thesis topic, if you're going to talk about hierarchical optimization, is what happens if your A star search tells you to take a step that is physically impossible for you to take a step because your legs aren't long enough? Now, what the A star search knows about is feet that are sort of detached from everything going step, 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 step. And it has some constraints so that ideally you never take too big a step. But in, you know, if you put in the simple constraints that make that impossible, you have very small steps. So you, it is inevitable that the high level plan that has this incredibly simple model does the wrong thing and the next level down or the next level down from that can't execute the plan. As I've described it so far, it's a totally top-down government, like the old Soviet Union. The guy at the top says, do this. The next level of bureaucrats say, do this. The next level of bureaucrats say, do this. And no messages percolate up from the bottom. It is an unsolved problem from our point of view of how we can get the bottom of the control thing where you realize I can't generate that much torque to talk back to the A star search, which doesn't even know what torque is, to make a different plan. Yeah? Sounds like the problem is you're not closing loops, right? You have some trajectory. Uh... Right, but how do you close a loop if the top level doesn't even know what torque is? How can you send the message too much torque? Right. If everybody used the same model and talked the same language, this problem would go away. No, no, I'm just saying, like, the problem lies in the fact that you're not closing the loop in that case, right? So you have a high-level controller at the top that isn't actually a closed loop system. It's open loop. That's why you're getting Right, but what I'm saying is I don't know how to close the loop. Because if everybody uses the same model, it would be trivial, right? Correct. But because we've seen this even last week, how you learn from controllers. Right. You, you try to learn a neural net from controllers, and the neural net can predict things that the controller cannot do, and you make them agree, etc., etc. Okay, so here, here's the deal. A search process like A star has a bunch of heuristics. One of the things you can do is collect good plans that worked and plans that didn't, and learn better heuristics so that less often you command plans that don't work. Oh, you throw away the heuristics, and you just learn this A star of how to work. We don't need this heuristic, that's the whole point of learning, right? Okay, we throw so that, that is incredible optimism. Okay. I admire that optimism. <laughs> I don't share that optimism. <laughs> okay, so let me talk a little bit about what goes wrong. And I asked, we, we never videotape our robots going unstable. And if we, by accident, videotape that, we immediately destroy the camera. <laughs> so I had to ask a postdoc of mine, please get me a video of things going wrong. OK, so first, I got to show you the video of things going right. So what we're going to do 
So I, this is a complete side topic. I believe we should have robot skin all over your body. I believe uh, you need to be able to replace the skin very cheaply. The way to have cheap skin is make it transparent, put cameras underneath it so you can see the touch. And this is a very crude prototype where we have cameras looking through transparent skin. And I'm not showing you the touching part, I'll show you that later. Here I'm showing you once you have transparent skin, you can see through it and do visual surveying through your fingers. Okay, everybody happy with that? Looks good? At some level, this is superhuman. Okay, so all we did is increase the gains by a factor of two. And, you know, sometimes the robot works okay. But a lot of times, things, what the colloquial term is, things go unstable. You know, it seems like a robot's very angry and aggressive today. <laughs> and one of the things that has been ignored in reinforcement learning is this issue of whenever you have a policy or anything that's based on actual state variables, you have to worry about going unstable. Many people try to train controllers using noise, but noise is benign compared to a delay or a bad model. And to make that point, I want to show you, it's not that I take pleasure in MIT's distress, although I do. <laughs> in the DARPA box challenge, a human made a mistake and press the wrong button. So while the robot was trying to get out of the car, it was using the wrong feedback gains. I want you to watch the left leg of this robot. Actually, yeah, that's the left leg. Did you see it oscillate? Okay, that's what happens if your learner that is choosing a policy is too aggressive about getting performance. And one of the problems with optimization and learning policies is the optimizer is effectively trying as hard as it can to be as aggressive as it can and take advantage of the model. So a big problem in optimization is how do you tell your optimizer that you're not sure about the model and to back off and not be too greedy? Okay. I wouldn't be raising this issue if I didn't have an answer. So, I believe in policy gradient uh, as a way to learn feedback controllers. So we're gonna optimize learning policies. We're switching in the dynamic programming context from value iteration to policy iteration. And in a trajectory optimization context from optimizing a single trajectory to minimize cost of that trajectory, you, you know, optimizing the individual torques or, or whatever the commands are, to optimizing a parametrized policy. Because if you have a parametrized policy, we can do something that's very, well, okay, more motivation. Uh, I already basically said that. Let me show you what goes bad and then I'll explain how to solve it. The simplest possible control problem in our universe is to control a mass in space. No friction, no gravity, nothing. It's just a mass and force equals mass times acceleration. I hope you've been told about something called a linear quadratic regulator. If you haven't, that's basically a form of trajectory optimization where you stay in the same place. Here is the optimization criterion. There's a cost on error squared and a cost on effort squared. I come from engineering, so I use U for action instead of A. You guys use A or U? Yeah, no, we use U because we talk about it. Excellent. <laughs> what letter do you use for state? S. Excellent. S or X? X. Oh my God, you're, you're halfway. If you were true AI people, you'd say S for state, like snake, and A for action. It all sorts of make, you know, maybe AI people are just more verbal than engineers, because engineers use X for state and U 
for action. I, you know, who knows why. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I design an optimal controller using the, the model. Then I introduce a, basically a low pass filter. That's this delta system. I'm using something called Laplace transforms to basically specify the filter. If you're not familiar with that, don't worry about it. Basically, it's a very benign filter. It's slightly underdamped and it uh, basically has a 10 hertz bandwidth. And if you use the optimized controller on the model, you get this nice blue line and a good thing happens. But if you use it on the, what we call the actual system with the low pass filter, in other words, an actuator that's not perfect, you go unstable. And a challenge for the field is how do you learn controllers so that you're not overfitting for the model and given a small change of the model, we do definitely do not want to go unstable because your error is huge. And it's, it's really bad for the robot to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, okay. So S for us is the uh, Laplace transform S. Okay, I assume learning was perfect here, that we learned the, the perfect model given the model structure that we think F equals MA. Our model structure didn't allow for an actuator that wasn't perfect. Okay, so what causes problems? If you have time delays, and that includes communication between computers and controllers or computers and other computers, if your actuators or batteries or whatever do, do not have infinite power, then it's going to take them some time to change their command or change their force. If you have some jello somewhere that resonates or additional modes that resonate, so everything is jello, so it's made out of springs and masses and dampers to take out energy. Uh, all of those are problems. Now, in reinforcement learning, people have said, if I train with noise, I'll be robust. Okay, so what we're gonna do is learn a controller and I'm gonna slowly jack up the noise. And what we see is these systems are not particularly robust. The maximum delay I could put in before they went unstable is 22 milliseconds. For some reason, this one uh, turned out to be a little more robust, but these are also bad. Okay, this is a log scale of how much, uh, in arbitrary units, how much white noise I added. This is very big noise. Like bigger than the you start to, if you were a human watching the thing, you'd start to see the noise at about here. Okay, adding noise is a bad way to go. And the reason it's a bad way to go is it's not all that hard to control with noise because there's, there's no propagation of your error. But if you have a misestimate of the mass or a delay, then your error on this time step is correlated with your error in the future. And that means over time, you can get a very strong push, whereas over time, averages of noise average out to zero. So let's ask the question, what are the ways to limit the bandwidth of controllers you learn? We want to bound a feedback gain, which is the derivative of the command with respect to a change in state. We could, inc if you are optimizing by penalizing performance and effort, you could increase the penalty on effort. That'll make you use less force, but that's very conservative. 
it's overly conservative, you'll just become a, a crappy controller everywhere. We can limit the derivative of the command with respect to time by increasing the state of the controller and explicitly penalizing that derivative uh, during the optimization. But that's not what we wanted to limit. We wanted to limit the derivative of the control with respect to state. We can bound the maximum control, which does not address robustness at all. We can, as we just talked about, learn a policy by adding simulation noise. This misses the correlation of the errors. We could do something called minimax, where you assume there's an evil opponent and you get to control the system and whenever you pick a, a command, it gets to pick the worst possible uh, noise to make things worse for you. Now, it can't pick infinite noise, so it, it can't always cause you to crash, but it can certainly make things bad for you. This generates very conservative controllers, so it's not a particularly good way to go. A heuristic of